Good morning. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, for the opportunity to come out into your house to share and worship of you, Lord. We thank you for all of your many blessings. We thank you for a great week with uh, Windshape Camp. We're grateful for the decisions that were made, Lord. Ask that you would be with these young people and bless them and help them to grow in strength and knowledge of you. Help us as a church to be there to partner with them and to help provide guidance and assistance in their path, Lord. We ask that you would bless this service this morning, that you would be with John as he shares your word, that you would grant us open and receptive hearts. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Art. Good morning, everyone. So happy to see you this morning in the Lord's house. For all of those who are joining us via live stream, good morning to you as well. Thanks for joining our little community of faith. Let's stand as we sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. your blessings. Name them one by one. God has done. 
too many blessings angels will attain. Help and comfort kiddies as you journey in. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to sing. God is so good. He's so good to me. God is so makes their way down in a moment we're going to sing the doxology we're going to stand and sing the doxology but i thought we'd do something a little bit different this morning and, and i want to give a little history on the doxology not just what we call the doxology but doxologies in general the doxology is actually a compound word uh, from the greek doxum meaning glory logia meaning words so basically they are glory words these are words of praise and adoration to our father but also these are glory words that don't just go vertically, but go horizontally. These are, are blessings and affirmations uh, and showing the love of God to others by what we say and what we do. We find a lot of this uh, in the Old Testament, like in Psalm 41. Uh, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. But it's not just in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, we see doxologies like Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Now I, I mentioned that their doxologies are not just vertical, but they are or horizontal too. They are, they are blessings to others. We see these a lot uh, in, in the New Testament, the, uh, the epistles often end with a blessing. But even as far back as like numbers, remember the, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. That's a blessing as well. Now as far as what we consider our doxology, um, we'll have to go back in time almost 400 years to the early 1600s to a fellow named Thomas Ken. Now before Thomas Ken was the Bishop of Bath and Wales, he was a normal kid. And unfortunately, this normal kid was orphaned. Um, but he had an older sister named Anne, and her husband raised him. And eventually, Thomas found his way to Westminster College. And this college had his heart, uh, even when, when he went through it. 
And, and afterwards, when he became a cleric and a bishop, he still had a very high affinity for this college. And so at the end of the 1600s, he actually wrote a compilation of three hymns uh, that was designed for the scholars of Westminster College. And uh, one of them is, Awake my soul and with the sun, all praise to thee, my God, this night. And my God, I now from sleep awake. And you notice there, there are specific parts of the day associated with these hymns. And that's on purpose. His, his mindset was he wants the students to, at various times during the day, set their minds to things above, not, not those are below. And if you always have uh, a mindset of, of things above, in his mind, your day is going to go a whole lot better, at, at least from an eternal standpoint. And so eventually, these three uh, hymns uh, were put into a, an appendix at the late 1600s, and then at the end of each one of these was what we know as Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Um, and it, about a couple decades after that, we actually had the, the actual, uh, what we call Old 100th, the, the me melody, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, that we know so well. Now, these, these hymns, they're stout uh, for, for our hymns, like uh, Awake My Soul and With the Sun has 14 verses. And you think, my goodness, that's, that's a, a lot. And again, the, the, the whole idea was that they would recite these hymns uh, in, in the morning when they wake up, in the evening when they go to bed. And the last one, my God, I now from sleep awake, is designed to be read at midnight when you can't fall asleep, or like me this morning at 3 o'clock in the morning, thinking... Oh, I have so much to do this morning. So instead of singing something to the effect of, I need some melatonin, you actually have all of these things that you can <laughs> look at. Things above, not below. Don't sing about melatonin. So uh, one, one of the verses of Wake My Soul is, Wake and lift up thyself my heart, and with the angels bear thy part, who all night long unwearied sing high praise to the eternal king. That's vertical glory words. But in, in just a couple more verses, he actually goes to the horizontal. Direct control suggests this day all I design or do or say, that all my powers with all their might and thy soul glory may unite. We're going to learn about that a little bit later when Pastor John comes up and, and preaches through Romans 12. Now, before we stand, I want to encourage you this week to carve out some time for glory words, to think, think about your heavenly father, to, to praise and adore him. But I also want to charge you this week to find yourself into situations where you can speak life into other people. It is no, how do I put this? It is no accident uh, where this church is located. Our address is not an accident. This is our mission field between the three, three mile radius of this church is 54,000 people, 47% of whom are unchurched. 10,000 of those households are single parents. We have a humongous mission field. And if just saying a, a single word could be the difference between a good day and a bad day, but it could also be the, the one catalyst that shifts from a cordial conversation into something that has more of eternal significance, inviting them to church, asking them, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? And this goes back to, to my heartbeat, is these are acts of worship. And worship is not something that just happens between the hours of 8.30 and 9.30 on a Sunday morning, nor is it something that happens just at this church on Sundays and Wednesdays. It is a, a lifestyle, a lifelong lifestyle. And when you're thinking of things above and thinking about being a blessing, that, that is something that you don't see in this world. And they know, they know we're Christians by how we love. It's basically taking, uh, going from being a hearer of the word to a doer of the word because faith without works is dead. We can, we can say we love people all day long, but if we don't know people, how can we effectively love them? So I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing the doxology, and take into, uh, again, take my charge into, into, into your heart. Find a, a situation sometime this week to speak life into people's lives. Here we go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Be a blessing. Thank you, Matt, for that teaching us how to worship. That's so important for us to understand our history and also what God teaches us. You know, in Master Life, we're learning about just beginning our prayer time with adoration, just adoring God and worshiping Him. We adore Him. We we praise him for the things that he's, he, he is, for who he is, for his character and his nature. We thank him for the things that he's done. We praise him for who he is. And I love the, I've always said, I think that's one of the best praise courses ever written, the doxology. I'm so grateful that Matt helped us understand more about it this morning. I, hope, I do hope you have your Bible. As Matt said, we're in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. We're going to finish that up this morning. And... Uh, I just want to remind you, Paul is writing here about how to demonstrate love that's genuine, love that is authentic, love that is sincere, and he's just given us 25 directives on exactly what that looks like. And here in the last few verses, he he talks about how we're supposed to, how how to handle our enemies. What do we deal, so it's it's one thing to show love to people that are easy to love, that are kind of, you know, friends and and family and even people that you don't know well because if you don't know much about them it's kind of easy to love those folks but there are some folks in life that are just uh, we'll say challenging right you know some challenging people in your in your life I read something uh, from the Saturday Evening Post a few years back about how several famous men um, described those people that they didn't particularly like with tact right there's a way to talk about people with tact Clarence Darrow said I've never killed a man but I've read many obituaries with great pleasure. <laughs> I love Mark Twain. He always said, he said, I didn't attend a funeral, but I did send a nice letter saying I approved of it. <laughs> Stephen Bishop, I feel, I feel so miserable without you. It's almost like having you here. <laughs> and then as Oscar Wilde creatively described it, some people cause happiness wherever they go. Others whenever they go. You know know somebody like that? You know any mean people in your life? I don't don't want you to name names here, but there are just some folks that are just kind of mean. They're just just hard to deal with, and you just can't deny it. And so how, as Christians, what we need to ask ourselves is how are we to respond to people like that? How how are we going to deal with people that are hard to get along with, people that might even you consider enemies in in your life? Well, the Bible gives us as it always does, some great relational principles about dealing with people. And beginning in verse 17, if you have your Bible open, Romans 12, 17. We're just going to read the verses as we go today. I won't read the whole passage right now. Uh, but let me just say this. As, as we, we're talking about enemies today, right? We're talking about people that are hard to get along with. And my guess is that since we are, there may be someone who already has come to mind to you, right? There may be someone in your life that is just difficult to deal with. It could be somebody in your family, it could be, you know, there's just, you have a family member that's just hard to get along with, or somebody, a, a neighbor that you have that's just hard to get to deal with, uh, somebody at work, maybe somebody at school, just someone in your life, and, and just, uh, it, it, you, you don't really like the, that person or the way that they treat you, maybe a better way to put it. And so how are we, how are we as Christians, as people who, who claim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who said that people are going to know us by our love, how are we to respond to difficult people in our life? Well, let's look at that this morning. I just want us to see uh, some of the things that God teaches us here in these last verses of chapter 12 of Romans. Before we go and study the Word of God, let's pray. Let's just pray. God, thank you so much for... We do praise you, Father, uh, for all that you are. Father, we praise you because you are a God who is uh, from everlasting to everlasting, a God who knows our every need, who knows us better than we even know ourselves, and a God who is all-powerful, all-loving, gracious, forgiving. Father, thank you for forgiving us because the reality is there was a time, the Bible says there was a time that we were enemies with you because of our sin. And you forgave us, Father. You sent your Son, even while we were dead in our trespasses, to die on the cross for us. 
And so, Father, help us to recognize that you have transformed our life. You've transformed our minds by the, by the renewing of them through your Holy Spirit. And I pray that today you would teach us what that looks like. As, as our minds have been transformed, as we're different people, we're new creatures in Christ, Father. Help us to understand how we should respond in a world that just so many times just fights back. Father, help us to respond as you would. In Christ's name, amen. All right, you ready? Number one, let's just go ahead and get into this. Number one, you just got to resist, number one in your notes, you got to resist your instinct for revenge. It's just instinctive for us to seek revenge, right? Look at verse 17. It says, Romans 12, 17 says, repay no one evil for evil. What did Jesus say about the golden rule? He gave us the golden rule, right? A couple of times in Scripture, in Matthew, also in Luke uh, 631, Jesus says, and as you wish that others would treat you, would do to you, do also to them. And so instead of giving back to people what they've given you, instead of pushing back, Jesus said, no, just treat them the way you want to be treated. Just show them the way that you want to be treated, your expectations. There's a saying that I've, I've learned is absolutely true, and that is this, and many of you have heard this before, it's hurting people who hurt people. Have you heard that before? They've got some kind of pain, some kind of a problem in their life, and maybe or their history in their life, and that's the way, the reason they're treating you the way they are is because of something else that's really unrelated to you. It's just something that they're either dealing with currently in their life or they've dealt with in their history, and it's just impacted the way that they treat people. And so for just a couple of seconds, when you're thinking about that person or, or people that are difficult to get along with, just it may be hard for you. You may not want to do it for long. We just kind of crawl into their skin and think, why, why would they be treating me like this? Why would this person be treating me the way that they're treating me? Because our natural instinct, right, if, if someone punches us, what's our instinct? It's to punch back. It's to push back. Somebody's pushing on us, it's to push back. And, you know, maybe to insult, somebody insults you, you're going to insult them right back there. But according to Scripture, that's something that we need to learn to, to deny and to resist to not push back. According to Scripture, right? And I'll tell you why in just a minute, all right? But that's number one. We just need to resist the instinct that we have, the natural instinct to, to get back at them, right? Number two, right, these kind of build on each other, do all that you can to live at peace. Now, number one is, is sort of passive, right? Just, you just don't do something. Number two is, is active. It tells us something to do. Look at verse 18. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I love that verse. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Do you ever know somebody that's always looking for a qualifier, for a, kind of a loophole? <laughs> yeah. I, I learned this, this week at camp that first grade boys are always looking for loopholes, right, for, for qualifiers. We were, I had the... Uh, the um, sea turtles, that was my group. A bunch of fourth grade boys, I mean, first grade boys and one little girl who was precious. And uh, poor thing, she was in there with like 14 little first grade boys. And so we had this, okay, sea turtles, our thing, you know, turtles have shells, right? So our way of getting them to line up after they went to the bathroom is shells on the wall, right? So put your shell on the wall, right? And so uh, Hannah Permenter, who was one of the helpers in the group, uh, told a little boy who was just having a hard time. First grade boys also have a hard time sitting or standing still. It's just not possible, actually. And uh, you think it's sea turtles, they'd move slowly, but not really. And so Hannah said, put your feet on the wall, right? So the next thing I knew, this little boy had his feet on the wall, but the problem is they were up here. He, he had done a handstand, and he was upside down, and he had his feet right where Hannah told, her, told him to put them, but they were on the wall. Some folks just are looking for a loophole, right? They're looking for a qualifier. He did exactly what he was told to do, just three feet above the floor. I was frankly impressed that he could do that. I've never in my life been able to do that, and I feel quite confident until I get to heaven, I won't, okay? <laughs> That's right. Well, there's, there's a qualifier here in verse, in verse uh, 17. Look at the last four words. Live in, I'm reading out of ESV. Yours may phrase it a different way, but in ESV, it says, if possible, live peaceably with all, right? Those, I got to tell you, if that's all it said, that would kind of be terrible, frankly. 
If, that's all, if all it said was you got to live peaceably with everybody, the Bible commands you to live peaceably with everyone, but the words before those words kind of give us a spiritual qualifier because it says this, if possible, so far as it depends on you. And so what the Bible is saying here is, here's the active part of this, we offer peace. We do all that we can. So far, as far as it depends on you, you do everything that you can to offer peace. I want you to think right now again about that person, whoever it is, in your, in your life, those people that maybe you've just got a challenge getting along with, okay? you got somebody in your mind. Most of us don't really have to think hard about that, right? And, and right now, you, you just, for whatever reason, you don't have a good relationship with that person, okay? This is what the Bible is telling us to do. My question to you this morning is, have you extended, to that person, have you extended an offer of peace, If you gone to them and said, look, I don't want us to, I don't want us to have a, a problem in our relationship. And, and I, I want to live peacefully with you. Have you done that? Have you extended an olive branch to that person? You just ex- from a position of peace, you just extend this offer. So that's what that's what the Bible tells us to do, right? And if you do that, let me just say this, and this is in your notes, one of two things is probably going to happen. Number one, A in your notes there, is peace is possible if you offer it and they receive it, right? It's great. Everything is great. You've won a friend, and now everything is better. So that, that's possible, and God can do that. God, God heals relationships, and his, our responsibility is to offer that, that olive branch and to do everything that we can to be sure that it's, it's received, okay? So that's possible. But here's B in your notes. It's impossible. It may just be impossible. When you, you offer, you make that offer, we do everything that we can, and they just refuse to receive it because sometimes to live peacefully with someone else is just not going to happen. It, it, it turns out that it's impossible because you extend that offer of peace and they just reject it. They're just not going to do it. Now, listen, you, you can't find peace, and most of you know this, trying to please everyone. You're just never going to going to do that because if you go through your life just simply trying to please everybody you're not going to live at peace with yourself and you won't you certainly won't live at peace with God but we want to be people of peace we want to be people who are offering those olive branches who are seeking to be at peace with everyone you won't be though and recognize the Bible acknowledges this that's why there's that spiritual qualifier in this passage because God doesn't want you to feel like you're guilty because someone doesn't receive your offer of peace. If, if our desire is to please God, which is what it ought to be, then he's even going to bless you by letting you get along with some people that, who've hurt you. He's going to let you get along with some folks. That's the pro- Proverbs 16, verse 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, when someone's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. That's a promise from God. What a wonderful promise in our lives. And let me just try to explain that. Because there are some people out there that uh, just with whom you're, you're gonna, not going to be able to live at peace. You're just not going to. Uh, you know why? Because the Bible says it just may not be possible. It just might not. Let me just remind you of something. I said this a few months ago, but it's important for us to remember. You may create enemies because of your position. But you should never create enemies because of your disposition. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? You know what a disposition is? What's a disposition? It's, it's, it's your attitude. It's your, your outlook on life. Have you known some folks that just, they're just mean? They just look angry all the time and they're hateful and they just they have a hard time smiling? Hard time? That's not a Christ-like way to go through life. That's not reflecting the joy and the hope and, uh, and the love of Jesus Christ. So check your disposition. Number one, check your disposition and be sure that it's, it's reflecting the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit again? Think about this. Here's, do a little checkup. I do this frequently, but let's do a little checkup this morning. Love. How's your disposition? Love. Joy. Does your countenance, does your attitude in life consistently reflect love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control is that the is that the fruit of, of your life when people see you is that the kind of fruit that your countenance 
is reflecting all the time? It ought to be. If, if Christ is in control of your life, that, that's, those are just you know, nine checkups for us that God gives us, right? So that's your disposition, okay? You should never create enemies just because you're a mean or disagreeable person. That's basically what the Bible is saying. But there are times when we, we take a stand on a position, right? When, when you, you take a stand on something which is biblical and, or just because you're going to maintain your integrity, and in those times, you know what? Sometimes you're going to create enemies because of that. Because you take a stand on something that's biblical, there are people that are not going to like you. There, for instance, there are people that don't like the fact that my position is that the only way to have a personal relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. They, they don't like that because, you know, somebody comes along and they, that's not what they believe. And they just think anybody, you know, all roads lead to heaven, right? And they say, well, you know, we need to live at peace with everybody. And so you just need to compromise that position. You just need to give a little bit on that position that Jesus is the only way. Because, you know, there's a lot of other ways. I can't do that. Because that wouldn't agree with Scripture. Scripture is very clear. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Now, I'm not going to be ugly about that. We should never, that's our disposition, right? I'm not going to be hateful about it. But I can say just as kindly as I know, no, no, this is, this is what the Bible says. And the Bible is my authority. And, and, and that's, that's my position. I'm not going to compromise my position. I want to live at peace with you. I, I, even on this disagreement, I want to live at peace with you. We, we can do that. So you, you have your position, right? It's based on Scripture. And if you're going to be biblically honest, then you've got to take a stand on that and speak the truth in love always. But when you do that, there's going to be some enemies that, that are created in your life. Some people that just don't like that and just don't like you. And that's why the Bible says, look, if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with folks. Don't let Satan cause you to feel guilty about some relationship. As long as you've done everything that you can, you've extended that offer of peace, and you still may not be living at peace with someone, you continue, listen, don't ever quit Extending that offer. That, so that doesn't mean that, okay, they've refused it. Now we're going to war. <laughs> That's not what it means at all. We just continue to offer that olive branch. We continue to love people. We continue to reflect the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentle, gentleness, and self-control of the fruit of the Spirit. Right? The Bible says it's not possible to live at peace with some people, but as much as it is, as much as it's possible, do that. Okay. There's number two. Number three this, this, this may be my favorite of all, the, all, all of them this morning. Get out of God's way. Just get out of God's way. When you've got to deal with people that are difficult to deal with, the best thing sometimes that you can do is just, just get out of God's way because God may be trying to do something in their life. Your disposition can be critical here, and God can use a, a, a positive disposition that's genuinely, genuinely reflecting the, the grace and the mercy and the kindness of Jesus Christ. It's critical there. But look at verse 19 again, okay? This says it all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written. Now, this is what God says. Venge this is God talking. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When it says, leave it to the wrath of God, you know what that means? It means that if, if you try to exercise revenge, or you try to pay back someone evil for evil, what are you doing? Then you're getting in God's way, and, and you're, just, you're just messing things up. You, so get out of the way and let God do what God wants to do. We, we need to understand that God, God repays evil. That's what the Bible says over and over again. That's what he says, I'm going to repay evil. Once again... Can I ask you about that? Think about that person, whoever it is, and it just make somebody up, right? Because he's probably been someone, if you're just living at peace with everybody, bless your heart, good for you. You can go ahead and step out. But most of us need to stay here, okay? Most of us need to hear this because we either are having challenges now or we will or we have. It's just gonna, it's part of life, right? So once again, think about that person. It's, it's difficult. Those people who have insulted you, they've hurt you, whatever it is. What do you want to do? You want to get back at them, right? The Bible says, don't. Don't do that. Just get out of God's way and let God do what God's going to do. Now, now I know we hear that, and some of us are saying, all right. Sick him, God. You know, <laughs> go get him, God. I can't wait to see this. Make him miserable. 
you're sitting back there you're, and, and you're just watching it happen. Let's just say somebody, you know, that, that you really don't like and their house burns down, right? You, you kind of go, they deserve that. Good way to go, God. Good for you. No, that's not the way that we respond. When misfortune happens to people that we don't like, if, if you're happy about it, then you've just blown the whole situation. You're doing it wrong, bottom line, okay? Listen to Proverbs. Just jot this reference down. It's going to be on the screen. Proverbs 24, 17. It says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. So pull your toes under because they're going to get stomped on right there. Right? Do not rejoice when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. If you do it, the next verse says, the Lord will see it, he'll see you there and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Right? It says, God's going to repay evil. And, and again, some of you may be sitting there and say, I don't know about that, Pastor. Because, you know, there's some people that have treated me dirty for a long, long time. Maybe, again, maybe family members that you've dealt with for quite a while. And it just sounds to me like they're getting on just fine right now. And just, just fine. They're, they're doing just fine and dandy. All I can say is, God's not finished yet. God is not finished. Just. Our, our responsibility is to get out of the way, let God do what God wants to do. And God may be in the process of bringing them back into fellowship with you. And it's just going to take some time. But when we take things into our own hands, th then we just make a mess out of, out of everything. And the best example I can think of, and I, I kind of referenced this a few months ago, in the New Testament, the best one I can think of is that night that Jesus was arrested. Remember the, the, the scene there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus had just prayed, and, and he's, he knows his hour is at hand. And the Bible says that uh, all of a sudden the this mob of soldiers shows up. It says they're carrying swords and clubs. And so naturally this mob shows up, and, and things are tense anyway because Jesus is sweating blood, right? And so they know something's going on, and all of a sudden the mob with swords and clubs shows up, and the disciples are naturally feel threatened. And so Simon Peter did what, which he was an instinctive kind of responder, right? He just did what was his natural instinct, what most of us would frankly do if we had a sword in our, on our side. He just pulled out his sword because he's going to defend himself and he's going to defend his Lord. And so here's this soldier coming at him. And Peter, who, by the way, was a fisherman, not a swordsman, goes to just run him through. And he goes, swoosh, and the soldier ducks. And you know what happens? Of course, he cuts the soldier's ear off. And Jesus says, whoa, Peter, whoa. He says, put your sword away, Peter. Because he says this, the person who lives by the sword is going to die by the sword. That's powerful words for us. Peter, basically, he says, don't you know that I could, I could send, call down 12 legions of angels, 72,000 angels, and they could be here right now to rescue me. But Peter, you're, you're about to mess up my plan. Put your sword away. Sometimes when your enemies treat you wrong and insult you and hurt you, and you try to get revenge, and you try to do something about the situation, all you do is you make a bloody mess of it. I know that right now, there's got to be some folks in this room or listening online, and you've got that sword in your hand, and you're about to strike. And if you had the chance right now, you'd use the sword, right? You'd hurt those people who have hurt you. Can I just say, if Jesus doesn't say anything else to you this morning in this message... That Jesus is saying, put your sword away. Just put it back in the scabbard. Because God is going to repay evil in his way, in his timing. God is just saying, trust me in this. Trust me in this. So far as it depends on you, child, he says, live at peace with everyone. And that leads us to the last thing here. Number four, this is probably the first part is what you want to hear. Kill your enemies, right? But kill them with kindness. Kill them with kindness. Look at verse 20. Paul says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. We love that part, right? You'll heap burning coals on his head. 
I know some of you are going, yeah, I want to see them. I want to see them burn. I want to see them suffer, right? No, our, our goal is not to burn people. Our, our goal is to bless people. As Christians, our goal is to be a blessing to our community. Our goal is to bless people the way that Christ has blessed us. Look at verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's the, there's the lesson for us. There's the way we leave this. We overcome evil with good. Gertrude Weaver, I don't know if any of you remember that name, but uh, she died in 2015, but she was 116 years old. She was verified as the oldest living person in the world when she died back in 2015 in Camden, Arkansas. She lived, she's one of our neighbors, right? And a year before she died, 115 years old, she was interviewed by Time Magazine. And they, of course, what are you going to ask somebody that's 115? What's the secret, right? What is the secret to living so long? And she said, simply, treat people right and be nice to others the way that you want them to be nice to you. Does that sound familiar? That's what Jesus said. That's the golden rule. She'd figured out that you know, what Jesus was teaching here, what Paul is teaching here, and, and what Jesus commanded us, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, just let me say very clearly, the golden rule does not guarantee that you're going to live to be 100. Okay? It doesn't. But it certainly will add joy and peace and years and, 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 uh, and hope to the years that you do live. And best of all, this is the best part, it's going to please God. And that's our goal in life, right? Is to make God happy and to please Him and to bring joy to His heart. Because when we bring joy to God, He returns that in our own lives. Let me ask you to bow your head. I've been asking you to think about a person today, right? Or some people. Here's what I want us to do right now. Will you pray for that person by name right now, silently? Will you just humble yourself and kind of pull back your pride? Because it hurts, it hurts. That's, not, it, that's a sacrifice of praying to people, to, to God about people. Or you just ask God that you would heal that relationship and to show you what you can do in that situation to heal that relationship, how you can extend that offer of peace. Ask God if you have. Maybe you think you have, but you really haven't. You've been offering peace, but you've got your other hand behind you with a sword in it. Would you just say, Lord, help me to drop that sword. Help me to release the sword. And offer both hands in peace. It's hard to do, isn't it? Our instinct is to fight back. But if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a new creature. And that means that your, your, natu- your, your supernatural instinct now is to love as Christ has loved. Father, I just pray for each one of us here and watching online too, Father, that we would, we would respond in your love, Father. We, we can't do that ourselves, Father. We need the Holy Spirit to, to e- equip us to do that. And Lord, I know that there are probably a lot of people in this room who have thought about situations and relationships in their life that really need to be healed for your sake, Father. They need to be healed. And so, Father, I just pray that you would help us to just love others the way that you've loved us, even in their sin, even in their antagonistic attitudes toward us. Father, help us to love them as you loved us in our sin and to forgive, to offer peace. And we thank you, Father, for what you're doing and what you're going to do. And we trust you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. And if there's a decision you want to make public, this, this is the kind of sermon where your decision may be very private. And so just continue in that time of prayer. If there's something you want to share with us, we'll be here to receive you. You come now as we sing and respond. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my 
my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. Stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to have a short little wind-shaped recap video right now. Pack my bags, hit the road with all I had. Driving around in circles, going way too fast. Got off track, but you brought me back. Yeah, the truth is, never knew you could love me like that. Now it's windows down and the sound turned out. No, I never felt so free. Every dream has doubts, every sky has clouds. But I know you'll always be with me. Ready for the sunshine, feeling alive. We can live it every day. Open road and blue skies, feeling all right. God, we can live Since I let you steer, the road is more clear. Hazards may gather, but I will not fear. Talking to all of my brothers and sisters, belongings I call and applaud and we. When I'm scared and it's raining, God, your presence remains in. Turn my worries to bravery, it's crazy. Ready for the sunshine. Boy, do I have more to say about that. But doesn't that put a smile on your face? I'm going to talk to you about a few other things because whenever I start talking about that, I'm going to lose all track. Just a reminder that today, church council immediately following the second service, Kids Quest, it begins on August 30th and registration is open. Parents can find the registration link on the eVision 
and the latest student ministry update. If you have questions, ask Alexandra. And the bulletin, it always has helpful information, so take a peek. And offering, there's many options. If you have questions about how to, to give your offering, don't hesitate to ask someone. I know last week someone stopped me in the hall and asked me a question. Just ask. Now, wind shape. You're going to get involved in this part, okay? So if you donated a snack for wind shape, can you just raise your hand? Put it down. If you helped tear down, set up areas of our church for wind shape, VBS, or the picnic, could you raise your hand? If you helped cook or serve a meal to wind shape staff, could you raise your hand? If you volunteered at Windshape or VBS this week, can you raise your hand? I wanted us to raise our hands, not to make someone feel bad if they weren't able to help, but just as a reminder of how it took all of us to come together to make this camp happen. And already, we're asking that, that you look into your heart and you think about joining us possibly next year, if this is a decision that our church decides to do camp, that you join us. Because I love to tell you that there's already someone that stopped me this, this morning on, the way, on my way in and said, I'm in for next year. So a little bit about camp. We had 180 campers that attended Windshape this week. 12 children attended VBS in our preschool wing and three in childcare so parents and grandparents could volunteer at Windshape. So what did the campers experience? They had worship twice a day in this room. They went to teen time, which is a small group time, twice a day. They had fun at REC and also learning a skill throughout the day. I want to tell you about how God opened my eyes because honestly, I thought the OWLS group that I was in with, which was fourth, fifth, and, and sixth grade kids, I figured, you know what, really, the, these, kids go, these kids go to church. They hear a message every week, at least every month. Uh, Joy FM's playing in their parents' cars. Uh, but boy, I, I was wrong. Uh, sure, we had several kids that fit that mold, uh, but about half, almost, almost half of our students did not even attend church on a regular uh, or weekly basis at all. Um, many had ended up having great questions during our team time together. Wednesday was our decision day, and a message with a plan of salvation was clearly given at, wish, at worship time. Then in team time, the plan of salvation was shared again with the campers from, from their team leader. The campers were given a worksheet to complete, and they were to answer some questions about what was discussed. They had the opportunity to mark if they had questions and would like to talk with someone about what was shared. Each camper had no idea what their neighbor was writing. It was not a visual invitation where a camper felt pressured to come to the altar because their friend did. And Friday was family picnic day. This room was standing room only. Parents got a recap of the week, but most importantly, the plan of salvation was shared uh, with the students again and with the parents. So the parents knew what, what had been taught. And as families left out this door, their entire family was given a box lunch donated from the Sunset Hills and South County loca locations, Chick-fil-A locations and families were spread out all over the front of church grounds having lunch, great conversation, playing yard games, and Boost Radio was here. So why did we do it? Was it worth it? Even if we planted a seed with one child, it was worth it. But we're excited to share with you that 28 children had questions and talked with a counselor about I'm sorry, 28 children had questions and talked with the counselor about Jesus and the plan of salvation. Folks, 16 children prayed with the counselor to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Let's give it up. <laughs> to God be the glory.
Will you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful for this past week here at camp, Lord. Now we come to you and we pray for that wind-shaped staff as they are starting to make their journey and their travels to their homes. They've been gone for nine weeks this whole summer just to different states, to different churches with their energy and, and their message and just working with churches like ours, sharing the message and the salvation. Lord, we ask that, that you give them rest and you give them and that, and that they're just able to, um, that, the, that their health is able to just, uh, uh, that they're, they're just able to, to uh, get nourishment and just uh, get ready. Most of them are going now on to college, Lord. Just ask that, that you be with them. Lord, for the campers, may they be reminded of everything that they were taught this week. Um, may uh, those that accepted you, Lord, may they, uh, as we look for mentors to be with them, um, may they help to encourage them to answer any questions, Lord, and we, may we as a church continue to pray for them. And Lord, finally, as our church leaves our mission field, uh, out into our mission field this, this morning, may we be reminded of Matt's charge to us. In your name we pray, amen.